well that I'm getting the last uh, run at this because I'm going to keep this as short as possible. Um, I would just like to circle back to, uh, I think, uh, what Professor Marx began this session with. Uh, that is, where are we in this whole process right now? In the larger context, uh, are we looking at this? Uh, is Manipur, in short, uh, quote unquote, ready for transitional justice or right for transitional justice? Or are we still in the process of combating impunity as such? And I would like to qualify that further. Uh, I would like to sort of what we began with. I would say combating immunity exclusively uh, through judicial institutions. And in fact, as of now, exclusively through the Supreme Court of India. And then further, exclusively uh, by way of this one bench, which is uh, sympathetic, uh, and by way of certain other benches, which have, uh, and if you look at the series of orders in this matter, uh, you can sort of map on the sympathies uh, of uh, the various benches. So in short, we're on a very tenuous sort of ground, right? Um, there's a very limited political opportunity structure here to sort of exploit. And I would just urge, uh, and I know it sounds extremely pessimistic, but I assure you that I'm not trying to be. Uh, but who knows I was in this, my first job was, uh, my first ever case that I ever worked on was the FAM case with Menika Gurusamy when she was appointed the amicus. Um, so I've sort of followed the case, and I've sort of been to Manipur over a period of time. Uh, so I say this with uh, you know, good intentions, is that I think all said and done, looking at where we are right now in terms of the BJP winning, and I think you had highlighted that for 1.5 years, as Birindu Singh likes to say, there has been no incident, there has been no, uh, he talks about militancy, he doesn't really talk about what the army is up to and what it's not up to. Uh, and so there is relative peace. And there seems to be uh, some impetus on behalf of the government, at least some rhetoric on behalf of the government, uh, to go along with, uh, with quote unquote, the agenda of HROs and CSOs. Uh, I think that needs to be exploited, along with the time that Lokur has on the bench, Justice Lokur has on the bench. Uh, because if you look at it, if you take a 30,000 foot view of it, um, the, secure, the national security rhetoric is not going away anytime soon, be it this government or the next government. Uh, in fact, just this year we've seen political activists and political leaders. Uh, I mean, if you look beyond extrajudicial killings, and I think any transitional justice framework would also have to address, for instance, uh, custodial torture or temporary disappearances or arbitrary detentions and so on and so forth. So I think we should be open to that possibility also. And we've seen this year already that a, I think the opposition party leader was arrested, or one of the uh, I'm sorry, very bad names. Um, so that person was arrested. There was the son of a of a ex serviceman, a Manipur Rifles serviceman, and the BBC had covered that. So these acts obviously are still going on, and the rhetoric around that. If you look at the say the director general of uh, or, or the commanding officer um, or the brigade commander, you know, every time they give interviews, they say no, the army has these do's and don'ts, and in fact, they've sort of like appropriated the language of the Naga People's Movement case. In, in a certain way, they sort of internalized it. And they say, no, we have our own guidelines. They're sure you have your own guidelines. But so we're seeing that they're sort of like, uh, they're morphing into this. You know, it usually happens that you'll find uh, the oppressor sort of, uh, quote unquote, again, if, if anybody has other inclinations uh, or views on this. Uh, but you see the oppressor sort of appropriating that language. And I don't think it's going away anytime soon, uh, this whole uh, national security uh, concern as such. And um, even beyond the APSPA, it's not just the APSPA, it's, um, it's say a lot, correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of the matters uh, go to paramilitary forces, state paramilitary forces, Thubal commanders, so on and so forth. So the problem is deep, the section 144 issues, so it's in effect martial law. And uh, that's a battle that has to be sort of fought, as she was saying, I think, uh, to that extent, I, I would agree with him, sorry, Professor Marx, is that it is a national problem. It's this sort of uh, failure of, uh, it's a nationwide failure. You, know, you see it in Punjab, you see it in all these states where there is um, uh, natural insurgency also. You see similar kinds of uh, laws being put in place. That said, right, so I think we're still at the phase of combating impunity and we just have that opportunity as of now to the Supreme Court. So it becomes really important then to look at the Supreme Court uh, strategically, beyond just looking at it, uh, looking at it from the point of view of okay, we're going to use the Supreme Court to get, uh, say the, and I, this is by itself very difficult to do, which is 
um, which is where you're at, which is to get the CBI then to file charge sheets time in a time-bound manner, which they have to follow, so on and so forth. Uh, but just to get that order is a very difficult thing to do. Uh, but I would just like to say, I mean, maybe, and not put all your eggs in that basket, but I think it becomes really important at this point to look at transitional justice, uh, if we're looking at potential frameworks, to sort of break them up and sort of do a transitional justice bricolage, if you will, which is a sort of a comparative law term, which is basically parts of uh, sort of best practices across the world and then mutatis mutandis apply them uh, to save Manipur, uh, which would again, uh, I'm sure, fulfill uh, Shiv's wishes of a, of a, of a subaltern narrative and as well as, and you'll be using an Anglo-Saxon institution to sort of, uh, you know, get that institution, uh, sort of gain legitimacy in that regard. So you should, I think, a series of applications or uh, petitions in the Supreme Court of India uh, aimed at, uh, or sort of using the semantics of transitional justice. So for instance, again, going back to uh, international law or regional mechanism literature, if you look at sort of the um, international court, um, sort of uh, the IACTHR, uh, which is the Inter-American Court for Human Rights, or you look at the ECHR's jurisprudence, or even the ACHR, which is the African Court of Human Rights, You'll find a lot of jurisprudence, I mean, around the right to know, the right to justice. You will also find a lot of jurisprudence around provisional protective measures, putting in place provisional protective measures for vulnerable groups, which would be women and children. Uh, so these provisional protective measures initially started off at uh, post-casualty. So say the father has disappeared and the children need some sort of protection because they're under threat. And then it sort of grew out of there uh, to say psychosocial help, um, a fund um, um, for, um, for the schooling, education, and then um, the safety of, uh, say, the widow, and so on and so forth. And it sort of grew and grew and grew, and now it's the, the jurisprudence is sort of, uh, um, it's, it's very concrete, it's very uh, sort of, you know, pro-human rights, in a way. And Madan Lokur, from what I know as of now, and just the court generally, all the way up to Chandrachur, is very comparatively inclined. Uh, because I remember uh, when Menika Guru Swami had made a submission that everyone was like, why are you submitting a compendium of uh, the international jurisprudence of human rights? Who's going to ever listen to this? And really that's what, that's what was quoted in those orders. And in fact, even in Naga People's Movement, you'll see all the progressive opinion uh, seems to be steeped in or taken from uh, international jurisprudence. So I think it's a great time to sort of use that and bring in the language of transitional justice, vulnerable groups, human rights defenders, protective mechanisms, provisional measures, funds, reparations, so on and so forth, reconciliation efforts, into the language of the Supreme Court orders. And once we have that, I think we have at least something to run with if and when we this opportunity closes itself or expands itself. Uh, so I think that's something, uh, something to look at, to sort of transition, if you will, from combating impunity to a more formalized sense of transitional justice. Uh, another way of looking at it would be uh, that they're not mutually exclusive. Right? It's, it's not like a conflict is going on, you can't have transitional justice. Uh, frameworks being put in place. And that will again go back to sort of informal frameworks for transitional justice, I'd say. Uh, which is, as we were talking about here, you know, engagement of churches, uh, church leaders, uh, engagement of, we already have so many women's organizations. In fact, I have very limited uh, uh, contact now, but uh, I remember Mary telling me so much about how it's the women's organizations which are sort of brought together, otherwise disparate, uh, uh, you know, uh, people who were ethnically disparate or uh, unaligned but had similar interests. It was only done through women's organizations across states and across uh, uh, tribes and so on and so forth. So uh, I think it's very interesting to bring them on board and sort of have a composition um, of with such actors sort of um, on whatever, informal truth commissions where you can take witness testimonies, where you can reify, his, you collate historical records and testimonies in ways that could either, which could have then sort of, uh, which could be in, in various languages, don't have to necessarily follow the Anglo-Saxon method, but something to sort of historically document all of these things. Uh, so that would mean firstly focusing institutionally on uh, separate sort of, or uh, customized um, institutions, uh, so truth commissions for instance, and so on and so forth. You could have an, uh, reparations and reconciliation, uh, sorry, reparations and uh, rehabilitation uh, organizations 
uh, which could be CSOs, composed of CSOs and other sort of um, culturally significant actors, if you will. Um, and then they can sort of opine on the basis of each case um, as to what should be the compensation that should be granted. And this is n none of this is obviously uh, formally enforceable, but it, it creates a record, for instance. Uh, as far as truth telling and reconciliation are concerned, you know, to take a—I uh, mean, he, he's gone now, but he—he—he uh, he, he made this comment that you know you can you can engage in transitional justice without the state. Uh, I guess you can, but I, I don't know how far you'd get with reconciliation uh, and how far you'd get with truth telling, uh, especially if you take shades of truth into account, you know, um, and especially if the both of them have to go together, if truth and reconciliation have to go together, so. Again, these are various, these are kind of intractable problems. They sort of resolve themselves on a heuristic plane as you go along. Uh, but I would sort of uh, focus on pieces of transitional justice. So maybe creating a historical record, memorialization, focusing on reparations, getting the Supreme Court uh, to sort of endorse that language, uh, getting the Supreme Court to direct the center to fund specific reparative, innovative reparative programs. So I think that would, that would be the way to go. Uh, now, I'll just end with this because uh, I'm also going on for very long. Um, yeah, I just want to sort of uh, bring up uh, the role of the armed forces, uh, not as a monolith, but say in terms of uh, how they could sort of participate even today, even today if you would have truth telling commissions, uh, sorry, uh, this exercise of truth telling. Uh, I know of uh, at least two instances. Uh, one of them includes my own father, because I, uh, full disclosure, both sides of my family, armed forces, grandfathers, both sides of my family, right? Um, so sometimes, you know, as I was telling him, th th there could be a genetic sort of, uh, <laughs> a genetic dustbin, if you will, <laughs> which is me, um, human rights person. So, uh, no, but in all honesty, so uh, this basically looks at the incentive structure within the army is the point that I'm trying to make, you know, even in truth-telling schemes or in uh, truth-telling narratives, it's important to bring out how the army itself is not a monolith and sort of have that conversation over a period of time. Uh, and there are, uh, rest assured, few and far in between, but there are very motivated, sympathetic actors uh, who are just maybe not waiting for a coalition, but who can certainly be co-opted into this narrative. And that sort of, again, goes some way, maybe in the future, in, uh, in sort of bringing, as you said, you know, there's this whole symmetry of uh, I mean, you're creating leverage slowly by using the court, and this adds to the narrative. So for instance, I know of uh, someone, uh, personally, who's been a um, family friend for a very long time, who's a major in the army, who's serving in Manipur. Um, quote unquote again, brilliant uh, CI ops uh, grenadier, uh, then joined the commanders subsequently. His brigadier would call him up every day, and uh, I can't disclose his name, uh, but his, and some very, very telling details. Um, his, brigade would call, his brigade commander would call him up every day, so this is sort of command responsibility and tell him that, listen, you have to, why have you been going on seven decades? So, it, so it's sort of divided into decades and CI ops, right? So they, they're given a certain area to man uh, and they're given a team of Javans and these are young officers and they say, and they go on decades and it's their discretion to go on decades or CI ops because whatever intelligence comes to them. And they're supposed to do this with, say, other paramilitary and police forces. So somebody must have sort of gone up the chain of command and said, this officer is not cooperating and he only wants to go on records. So he told the brigadier that there's nothing happening here. You know, it's very peaceful. So why should I be organizing a CI ops? And eventually the pressure that was applied on him, despite the fact that his father at that point of time was, and his grandfather, uh, his father was actually serving. He was in a very high rank in a different place, in a different command. And his grandfather was a was one of those uh, PVSM, BSM, you know, chakra medal people. Uh, despite that, this this person had to quit the army only because he sort of heard the voice of his conscience. You know, so that's the amount of pressure that's being applied on some of these uh, officers. Nothing to say of Javans. And of course, there's also so there are many stories out there. Uh, and you know, again, this is not to turn it around and say, look, the burden is on us now to go and look for them. But I think. Those can be sought out. There can be people who might be interested in it, and they could form a part of this transitional justice narrative. Uh, I'll end with that. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs>